It could have been when you were five years old when your parents were reading the Bible over you in bed. Or it could have been when you were 25 years old or maybe 55 years old. Or maybe today the Lord is seeking you and he's finding you right where you're sitting today. The ark has been built. The rain has started to pour. And once the door is shut, it won't open anymore. You've heard me say before, just like the Bible says, he will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Crossroads Church of Denver. Let's continue with worship this morning.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us with a love that is unfathomable for us, Lord. We thank you that you leave the 99 to go after the one. Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us now as we spend time in your word, that we would just be changed more into your likeness, that we'd learn more about your character and the heart of, of your, your heart, Lord, your heart of love toward us. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment to greet one another this morning. Good morning, Crossroads. My name is Mike. Uh, it's great to be here with you this morning. Just have a few announcements for you guys. All right. As you guys walked in today, I'm sure you saw there's a booth set up out front in the lobby uh, for the Love Life Prayer Walks. Uh, they do a lot of work in the pro-life movements. And... Uh, and uh, so if you guys want to learn more about that and what they do, uh, there is a booth set up in the front. Please check it out, see what they have there, and uh, if it's something that uh, God puts on your heart, you should, you should join with them. It's a great cause that they're doing, and it's, it's great work. Um, we also have our parenting packet information for anybody who has children that go to children's ministry downstairs. Uh, they're getting some updated systems and they need these packets filled out so they can get all the data entered in uh, appropriately. So please have those turned in by January 21st uh, if you have any kids in the, ministry, uh, the children's ministry. And then also, if you are interested in volunteering in the children's ministry, we always have room for you. Uh, again, you don't have to volunteer every Sunday. You know, you can take one Sunday a month or help out here and there. Uh, but they could use as much help as the as you guys are willing to give, and so please think about that, pray about that, and uh, we would love to have you. If you do want to volunteer, if you have any questions, uh, please see uh, Denise, uh, Dominica, um, or you can email her. Her email is in the uh, packet here. And then last uh, but not least, January baptism is Sunday, January 28th, right after service. We will be inside, and I've been told the water's warm, so uh, don't let that stop you if that's something that uh, God has put on your heart to do. We'd love to see you there. And then lastly, uh, Judy, could you stand up for me? It's Judy's birthday today, everybody. She is uh, my grandma-in-law, whatever that means. But uh, we love you so much, Judy. Happy birthday. And with that, Pastor Adam. Don't let anybody know it's your birthday around here. <laughs> well, welcome to Crossroads this morning. Uh, you may or may not know, but today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. And so uh, this morning I invited Michelle Thorson, who is leading our Love Life ministry, just to say a few words about what's going on for the year. And uh, she's going to tell you about a, march, uh, a, a walk that's coming up. I call it a march because, you know, I love to march when I'm walking. But uh, I want to invite you up. Michelle, just say a couple words about love life and what's going on. Welcome, Michelle.
Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Adam. Um, thank you, everyone. I Good morning. Yes, it is National Sanctity of Life Sunday, and I just really want to give a, a big thank you. I'm so grateful to Pastor Adam and Justine and the board for um, partnering with Love Life, becoming a house of refuge, and um, adopting church or adopting prayer walk weeks where, where churches come out and walk with us um, on our prayer walks. So thank you so much. We are so, uh, we really need to honor them. You know that really, this doesn't happen you guys with churches. This is very rare. Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, we're blessed to be in this position. For those of you who don't know me, um, I've been a, a member of Crossroads for over 20 years, my husband and I. And our son was raised in this church. Um, I actually got saved at an altar call at the vineyard 30 plus years ago um, when we were the vineyard for that period of time. And part of my story is that my pro-life journey um, began 27 years ago, the day after I had an abortion, uh, when I began experiencing symptoms of post-abortion syndrome. And, while that's devastating and tragic, I just want you to know there is hope and healing. Praise the Lord. He led me to a, an abortion recovery Bible study, and I received that healing that I desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. So Sanctity of Life Sunday. This was a proclamation that was issued by Ronald Reagan in 1988. Um, 11 years after Roe v. Wade was initially decided in 1973. And um, you guys can look it up and read it. it it's actually a, a very um, well-written proclamation and, um, and that he wanted us to remember um, the sanctity of human life and every human being, uh, including in the womb. Um, and, and how precious that life is. And so it, that was an amazing um, proclamation that, that he made back then. Um, if you're new at Crossroads, I'm the city director for Love Life in Denver. We're one of 25 chapters. Um, I learned about this three years ago. And um, we're, if you know anything about pregnancy centers, we're like a pregnancy center on steroids. Uh, from the sidewalk of abortion clinics to the delivery room and beyond, um, it's really Christianity 101. It's, it's the complete package, loving your neighbor as we love ourselves. And that includes men and women who have had an abortion in their past. There is hope, as I mentioned, healing and forgiveness through abortion recovery Bible studies. We know that one out of four men and women have had abortions. So regarding the prayer walks, if you've participated, thank you, thank you, thank you. If, if you've helped with our baby shower for Nadia, thank you. We so appreciate your support. Maybe you've prayed. Bless you. God bless you. Ken and Roma have been amazing to, to, to work with me on what our prayer needs and praise reports are, and thank you guys for that. Um, they are so dedicated to that. At each uh, prayer walk, we invite churches to adopt one week a year. Um, and so... Ideally, we have a church at every prayer walk. Um, and they're peaceful prayer walks. We're not, we're not protesting. We're not engaging with anyone out there. So the next one is February 10th. That's our first one this year, and we'll have one a month through November. So watch for that in the bulletin. And then finally, I'll just mention, some, some of you have um, this card in or near your seat. It's called a response card. If you have any interest in anything um, that we're doing, you can circle your area of interest and you can drop it off with us. You can talk to us at the table. You can actually um, scan the QR code and just enter your area of interest in the system and, and Love Life National will get you started. Um, but we really need help. Um, we were able to save eight babies last year, praise God. Um, actually, to date, to date, uh, because we have one that we know of that was saved this year. And so we just, we need more help. That number will definitely increase because we've seen it across the country in other cities. Um, so the greatest need, sidewalk outreach and prayer walk volunteers to help run our prayer walks. And um, 
I just want to say we have so much fun. We have we at the prayer walks. I know it's a very difficult topic, but the fellowship, faith, and friendship that we've developed is is glorious. And the beauty of what we do, saving those babies, is um, second to none. So with more help, those numbers will increase. And just lastly, if you have an abortion in your past or know someone who does, we understand and we're available to pray and to talk with you today or arrange um, a confidential meeting at a future time because um, there is hope and healing and restoration. So thank you so much um, and pray about uh, working with us. We'd love to have you, every single one of you, honestly. Thanks. Let's take a minute and pray. Hold on, hold on. Let's take a minute and pray over Michelle. Father, we come before you. Thank you so much for this ministry that Michelle has taken upon her shoulders. Lord, the weight is heavy. Lord, it's the walk and path is difficult. But Lord, it's so wonderful when a young lady comes up to them and says, can you please help me have an alternative? Lord, we pray that you would just uh, fill her with the Holy Spirit, overflowing, Father God. Let us be able to support her, Father God, in the ministry you've called her to. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to give you a duty to take this back to the back. Yes, give her a hand. <laughs> Open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 22. I have a message this morning called, Why Are You Waiting? Why are you waiting? So with that, let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Father, your word carves into our heart. Your word separates the conscience, Lord, from what we do and as we sin against you, Father God, it separates that conscience, Lord, that conviction, Lord. Father, I pray this morning as I give this message, Lord, I believe it's from you. I pray that you would do that digging, Father God. Lord, that you would do the planting. Lord, that you would do the seeking. And Lord, that you would do the finding. Lord, we thank you for bringing us to this place this morning. Pray that you would envelop us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we stopped a little short, and you'll know why I stopped, because it would have taken a while to develop what I wanted to develop last week. And I was going to go on to chapter 23 this morning, but I really believe the Lord put something on my heart last week that I need to share. And uh, I know that most of you in the room and those watching online are believers, but guess what? There might be one person in the room, one person watching online, and I'll bet you there's more, who do not know Christ. And so it's really important that we... Uh, talk about what happened with Paul and what happened in his life when he came to understand this revelation that Jesus was the Christ. And so this morning, if you'll go to Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Acts chapter 22, verse 16, the Bible says, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This was the this was the question given to Paul by Ananias after uh, the Bible says that the, the, as it were, the, the, the blinders fell off of Paul's eyes. The scales fell from his eyes. He was able to see. And this is where we get the terminology, once I was blind, but now I see. We see that Paul comes. He's, he's struck blind. He's got this bright light. He hears the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I mean, if there was ever a... Uh, seeking and a finding, it happened with Paul the Apostle. The Lord sought him out. You know, I love to watch uh, uh, documentaries of weaponry. And, um, you know, weaponry is, it, it's very dangerous, but it's very, very necessary to keep our country safe. But, you know, they've, they've honed in on some of the weaponry where they could actually hit a target that's within six inches of where they planted the target, where they put the bullseye. And you know what? If there was ever a bullseye on the Apostle Paul's life, it was the bullseye from God the Father. The Lord put a bullseye on his life for his salvation. He put a bullseye on his life to communicate with him, to interact with him, to influence him. 
And guess what? The Lord did the job. The Bible says that he's on the road to Damascus and he's knocked off of his animal. And he sees a bright light that blinds him and he hears the voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Of course, Saul's response, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, we've all been in that situation. If you're a believer today, you've been in that situation where it was seek and find. The Lord sought you out. And as we talked about a couple Sundays ago, it could have been when you were five years old, when your parents were reading the Bible over you in bed. Or it could have been when you were 25 years old, or maybe 55 years old, or maybe today, the Lord is seeking you, and he's finding you right where you're sitting today. You didn't know it. There's a target on your back. It's from God the Father. He wants your life to be changed forever. And so we see here that when, when uh, Paul goes to, into Damascus and he's met by Ananias, Ananias says, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There was a revelation given to Paul. And this morning I want to talk about that just a little bit. What's interesting is that throughout our lives, we are exposed to revelations that totally transform our lives. Um, I'll never forget when I realized that the little arrow on, beside the gas indicator in my car showed me which side the gas cap was on. <laughs> that's re re revolutionary. Some of you are going, that's what that's for? <laughs> How many times have you pulled into the gas station and you get out and you're getting ready to pump gas, you already paid for it, you turn around and there's no gas cap. And you've got to get in your car and quickly before somebody pulls in front of you and puts gas in on your credit card, you got to turn around while the little arrow by your, by your gas indicator in your dashboard tells you which side the gas cap is on. God bless you. Thank you. I, that's, <laughs> I won't charge you for that information. I can remember, you know, there's been times where I've given a, a button-down shirt away. I love wearing button-down shirts. I give it away or I, I take it to the Goodwill because a button falls off. And then somebody pointed out that there's buttons underneath the hem that you could just sew another button on. You know, revolutionary, right? I mean, there's some things that are just revolutionary that we learn, and sometimes we don't learn them until the, the last quarter of life, which is horrible. But <laughs> while the Apostle Paul was exposed to the truth about Jesus, and this was revolutionary for him, this would have blown his mind. This would have been something that he could have never fit into the context of how he grew up and how he was trained in the Bible. But you know what? It caused him and it forced him to have to do something with that information. And this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. Because here in verse 16, Ananias asks Paul a very important question following his undeniable encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Why are you waiting you know, that question is universal for all of us who are hearing the voice of God. God has a job, as I always say, for all of us. And the question sometimes is, why are you waiting? There's a lot of reasons why we wait. Whether it's fear, whether it's a lack of confidence. If you're like me, maybe I'm, I want to make sure that I'm hearing from the Lord. There's a healthiness to this. But when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to actually the Lord exposing himself to us, as a non-believer, it's one of the most important questions that must be answered for our salvation. What are we waiting for? If the Lord has revealed himself to you, there's action that needs to be happening in your life right now. You need to be able to go forward and have that salvation from the Lord. You know, some of you hearing my voice this morning are being challenged with that very question. And I, I hope this morning it's my prayer that you would respond to that question and you would respond to the Lord with action. Turn with, turn with me to Acts chapter 2, if you don't mind. We're going to do a little Bible study dig in this morning. This dialogue and these, this, this awareness, this revelation, not only happened to Paul the Apostle, but it also happened to 3,000 people who were in a crowd on the day of Pentecost. And if you'll read through this chapter with me to verse 37, we'll do some Bible reading this morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Then when they were all amazed and marveled, saying to another, one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, and I, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence." Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Listen to this next verse very carefully. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? This is a perfect question that should be asked. When a revelation is given to you by the Lord, when the Lord reveals himself to you in all of his power, in all of his might, in all of his glory, in, in all of his non-confusing way, you should be able to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Ananias should be able to say, why are you waiting? Let's go on to verse 38, because Peter answers them. Then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The moment that the truth was revealed, action was required. In April of 1995, I found myself drunk in a park in North Denver. 
And it's not a story that I tell very often, but when I was drinking in that park, I was lost. I had just had a friend who was executed, literally, uh, was two guys went to his house, and when he opened the door, they executed him for something that had happened on the streets. And this guy who was executed, my friend, was part of our gang. He was part of our group. And, and in the, in the, when I was young, we would look for family. We had our family. We had our family unit at home. In other words, our brothers, our sisters. I didn't have any brothers, but I had sisters. But we had uh, my mother, my father. But there was a lot of things going on at home. There was a lot of confusion happening there. And so you find your family out on the street. You find your family with your, your friends. And of course, we were in a gang, and so that became sort of my family. And so now there was a lot of confusion because somebody from my family on the street killed another person from my family on the street. It didn't make sense to me. I thought if I can't find stability at home, maybe I could find stability with my friends on the street. But there was no stability either there because sin reigns, folks, in every group that you're in. But here's the thing, I was thrown into confusion. I did not know what to do, and uh, my mother, who was a strong Christian, was constantly telling me, you need to turn your life to Jesus, you need to repent, you need to turn away from your sin. Well, I didn't think I was such a bad guy, you know, am, am I really a sinner? I mean, I've never done anything like Charles Manson, that's who I thought was a sinner. But you know, comparatively speaking, I felt like I was doing pretty good, even though I was making a lot of wrong decisions, I was a pretty bad kid. But here's the thing, what happened is that that question came to my mind, what if there is a God? What if there is a God? What if my mother is right? What if there is a God who created the heavens and the earth, who spoke and creation came into existence? And I'll never forget being in that park in North Denver and yelling out into the sky, God, if you're real, reveal yourself to me, show yourself to me. I'm lucky I didn't get struck by lightning that night. <laughs> but this is just really what happened. This, is, this was a pouring out of a, a, a young person who wanted truth. I wanted to know what the reality was. Well, nothing happened in the park that night, but I'll never forget, we, we had a little gathering for my buddy who had passed away, who had gotten executed, and it was a, it was a Saturday night when we got together. And this had been on my mind, what is truth? Is there a God? You see, I was raised to believe in, in my own heart that there is no God. That in, in the Eastern Hemisphere, we have the Buddhists who have their God. We have the, we have the gods in India. There's thousands of God in, gods in India. Every, every belief system has their own God. They have their own way of believing. And so in this little pea brain of mine, I figured, you know what? Here in America, here in the West, we have Jesus as our God. Everybody serves whatever God is available to them regionally. If you go to parts of Africa, there's regional gods. You go into South America, there's regional gods. And I just figured we were just the same. We all have a little talisman, as it were. Uh, how many of you had the St. Christopher you put on your dashboard to protect you from an accident? And they found it down the block after you got in your accident, you know? <laughs> We all grow up with sort of a belief system, something that we have adopted. But I wanted to know, is this true? Is there any truth to this? Because if there is truth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God, that he is the creator of the world, the creator of the universe, then I have some action that needs to happen. And I cried out in that park, if you're real, prove yourself to me. Well, the next morning was Sunday because Sunday follows Saturday. And I'll never forget, we had drank all night. We had did drugs all night. This is my past, folks. And we probably didn't go to bed till 3 in the morning, and bed was wherever you passed out. Well, I'll never forget waking up early the next morning, and this thought came to my mind, go to New Hope Ministries. The reason the thought came there is because I kept passing by this building, and, and on the front it said New Hope Ministries. I had never been there before. I didn't even know what the place was. But I was seeking, and so I was willing to make some action. I told one of my buddies, hey, give me your keys. I want to go to church. And he threw his keys at me and laughed and said, you don't have to lie. You could borrow my car. <laughs> I park in the parking lot of New Hope Ministries out on Florida and, and the Sheridan area, between Federal and Sheridan. And I'll never forget parking the car and taking the key out of the ignition and talking to God right there saying, all right, God, 
if you're real, when I go into this building, I want to see you. I want there to be a, a, a revolutionary appearance of you. This is your house, obviously, so appear. Show me that you're real. Again, I'm lucky that lightning didn't come down and strike me. But then I thought, well, who am I talking to? You know, I didn't believe that there was really God. I, I grew up with this belief system, but, I, but doubt crept into my mind. And I'm going to tell you why doubt cre creeps in. Doubt crept in because I started looking around and seeing how everybody else lived their life. Doubt also crept in because my sin is what I wanted to do. I didn't want God or Jesus to interfere with my sinful uh, behaviors. I wanted to do what I wanted any old time. And so at this point in time, what happens when you live in that world, you push out every bit of truth that could be in, involved in your life. And so I'll never forget, I walked into this church, and this was a storefront church, was, which was really different to me because I had never been in a storefront church. This wasn't a church with a steeple. You open the door, and there's all the people. It was a church that was a Safeway before. In fact, you could see Safeway printed underneath the big letters where it said New Hope Ministries. And so I walked in. And I'll never forget, there was this, this big jolly guy who shook my hand. He had tattoos on his face. And I, I remember thinking they, they hired the local homeless guy to shake hands with people, you know? Well, he ended up being the pastor. <laughs> so I go in, and not to draw, draw this story out, because I, there's a point to my story why I'm sharing it with you this morning, but at the end of service, I had went there expecting to see God. And towards the end of service, the pastor says, well, let's all stand, let's all pray, let's sing a song. And I remember pivoting in my chair saying, there's no God. These people are all fake. And then all of a sudden in the corner, this lady started speaking another language. And I had never really heard tongues. And I had, even in the church we grew up in with my mother, they didn't do that a lot at, at the church. And so I heard this lady speak another language real loud. And and I thought, well, at least I could see them get thrown out. You know, this lady's interrupting service. At least I came and got some action out of this. But they didn't throw her out. In fact, everybody got very quiet. And in fact, everybody bowed their head. And I was wondering what in the world is going on. And then out of, out of the mouth of another lady on the other side of the church, she started to interpret what this lady was saying. I didn't really know that at the time. But she started to say very loud, my people, my people, I have heard your cries. I've heard your prayers. And I have brought somebody here who will lead you. I've opened many doors, and I've brought somebody here who will lead you through those doors. And I remember thinking, what kind of drama play is this? What's going on here? And I'll never forget this jolly pastor got off of the, off of the stage, and he walked all the way back. And I was sitting as far back as I could, right by the exit door. And he says, it's you. It's you. And I looked around, and I, I'm like, I don't go to church here, man. I don't know you guys. And he said the words, this is what he said, you ask God to prove himself to you, and he has. I was so struck with fear, I yelled out, I didn't ask God for nothing. <laughs> and I turned around, and I took off. I, I went back to my buddy's car, and I got in, and I left. But I'm going to tell you something, it affected me. How did he know what I was thinking. How did he know what was going on in my mind, this wrestling that was happening in my mind? How could that happen? For those of you who are skeptical about my story, you could be skeptical. It's what happened. It blew my mind as well. And by the time I got back to my neighborhood, the, the enemy had convinced me that they do that with everybody who comes in you. They, they tell Sister Lala over here, speak in tongues, and they tell Sister Bernice over here, interpret, my people, my people, and and they, they got you cornered, baby. And so by the time I got back to my neighborhood, I thought they do that with everybody. This is a tactic. That's why there's so many people there. <laughs> why well, blew it off, but not altogether. Then my sister moved here from California. She had been going to some crazy church called Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And she came and she started telling me, Man, I've been hearing about your lifestyle. I've been hearing, mom has been telling me how much trouble you're in. You need to repent. You need to change your life. Back then, we had those cords. Young people, we had phones with cords on them. <laughs> and you were able to hang up the phone. And that's what I would do. And she would call over and over and over and cry with me and pray with me. And I would just hang up the phone. I didn't want to hear it. And then one day, she invited me to her crazy church. And we went, we went, 
And all of a sudden, I'm in church, and I'm hearing this guy. He's preaching, and he, I don't, I'm not listening to anything. There's over 1,000 people there. I'm not hearing any, anything that he's saying. I'm just looking at my watch wondering when he's going to be done. And all of a sudden, at the end of service, he says, I want to pray for every person in this building. Well, there was over 1,000 people there. I looked at my watch, and I thought, we won't be out of here until 3 in the morning. <laughs> so I pivot to leave, and as I pivot to leave, the pastor, the, the preacher, the guest speaker, the evangelist who was there on the stage, he points back to the back row, because we I sat way in the back by the exit door. He says, I don't know who you are, but ever since you walked in the door, the Lord has told me to give a message to you. I remember going, I don't go to church here. Who is this guy? Well, I had made an agreement with my sister earlier that I would go to church if they let me go with my backwards baseball cap and, and a sweatshirt. Well, that's what I had on, a backwards baseball cap and an oversized sweatshirt. And he said, you in the back there with the baseball cap, backwards baseball cap, the oversized sweatshirt and the earrings. I had my ears pierced. Well, that was it, because everybody was in their Sunday best. It was a Sunday night service, but people were dressed to the T's, to the nines, if you will. And I had a ba baseball cap on and a sweatshirt. Well, I knew he was talking to me, and not only did I get upset, I got angry, because I thought, you know what? These Christians are jacking with me, man. They're calling each other somehow, and they're, they're, they're saying, hey, man, this dude, this, this short guy, he's going to come in, and he's going to be doing, and you know what? Just let him know that God has a message for him, and I was trying to figure this out. Well, I got so angry that I thought, you know what? I'm not going to let these Christians embarrass me anymore. I'm going to go show, teach him a lesson, and I walked right up to him, and he was on an elevated stage like this, a little higher than this, and he squatted down to talk to me. And I got right in his face, and my plan was to punch him in the face. Everybody was going to laugh, and I'm going to take off, and that'll teach them a lesson. But when I got up to his face, he says, I don't know who you are. He says, but the Lord has told me to tell you, you asked him to prove himself to you before. Woo! And he did, and you didn't listen. Now, my mind started going through the Rolodex in my head. Did I ever tell my sister this story? And I started forming an anger towards my sister. I know what she did. She told this guy that I had had this experience at this, this other church, and, but, but I don't think I ever told her. I'd never told anybody that story. That was such an embarrassing story. I never told one person. I was just looking for a place to put my anger, an excuse to push the message away. Well, I remember picking up my fist to punch him. And by the way, this story made the Assemblies of God newspaper that went around the world. They told this story. And I picked my fist up to hit him in the face, and something came over me. And I can't explain it except that I know it was God. And I felt like I was going to hit the floor. And I put my fist down, and I shook it off, and I picked my fist up again at him. And he was talking to me, and he was saying things like, you know what, the Lord has a calling on your life. And I thought, I'm going to really hit you because if you knew who you were talking to, God would never use me. And then all of a sudden, I felt like I was going to hit the floor again, and I shook it off, and then fear came over me, because I thought, I'm dealing with something that's real here. And I'll never forget, he took some oil and put it on my forehead, and he said, the message had been sent. I left that night not really knowing exactly what to do. I was very, very angry. I left very upset. I, I didn't repent at that point. I was very upset. I was very angry. I had all my anger pointed at Christians because they're messing with me. I know it. This is why nobody goes to church because they point you out in the crowd. Everybody gets pointed out in the crowd. I figured that's how they get church members. You get pointed out in the crowd and you become a church member. But I went home that night very angry and we don't have time to get into it and most of you have heard my story but for the next three nights, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night, the Lord spoke to me in my dreams. And by the way, this is not just a natural occurrence. It's, this has never really happened again in my life. But on Tuesday night, I had this dream when I went to bed that me and my buddies were robbing this 7-Eleven. It was just a dream, folks. Me and my buddies are robbing this 7-Eleven, and I'll never forget, we, we robbed this 7-Eleven, we run back to the car, and there's a Monopoly guy sitting next to the car, the driver's side, and he hands me, he's sitting on a little director's chair, you know, a little top hat mustache, and he hands me a card. It's a white card with black letters that says, Last Call. 
And I look at the card, and, and I went to go ask him what it was about, and he disappeared. So we got in the car, we were taking off, and then my dream switched. And all of a sudden, I was walking through this graveyard, the cemetery. And, and it was a summer day, but it was overcast. So you couldn't see the sun. It was a cloudy day, and the grass was green. And, and all of a sudden, I was walking towards this canopy where they were having a funeral service, and there was dozens of people around. And as I walked forward, the, the crowd sort of split and I was going forward, and there was a table there, about a three-foot-high table with this big, giant hourglass. And the hourglass was filled with red sand. And the bottom of it was all full of sand, but there was just a little bit of sand that hadn't fallen yet. And all of a sudden, before I could, before I could see the sand fall, my dream switched. And all of a sudden, I was taken in my dream to this auditorium, kind of like the Pepsi Center. It was a huge auditorium where thousands of people could sit. And I was either up on a balcony or up in, in the cheap seats, but I could see down onto the stage. And there were hundreds, if not thousands of people there. And there was a guy on the stage, and he's walking back and forth, and he's preaching with passion. And all of a sudden, at one point, I'm not understanding what he's saying, he pulls a handkerchief out of his pocket, and he wipes the sweat from his forehead. And then he puts the microphone back up to his mouth and he says, if you haven't heard anything I've said tonight, hear this. The ark has been built, the rain has started to pour, and once the door is shut, it won't open anymore. I had never heard a rhyme in my dreams before or since then, by the way. That moment, I woke up. Have you ever woken up from a sleep where you just opened your eyes and you were fully awake? Folks, I knew that I had an encounter with God. I knew that I had an encounter with something that was bigger than me and someone who was bigger than me. And I turned around on my pillow and I said, God, I have no idea who you are. Are you the God of the Catholics? Then I'll go to the Catholic Church. Are you the God of the Mormons? I'll go to the Mormon Church. Are you God of, of the Jehovah's Witnesses? I'll go there. Are, who, who are you? I don't know who you are, but I want to give my life to you. See, a revelation, it demands a response. A revelation demands action. And why I tell you that story is not to glorify my story, but to tell you that the Apostle Paul had the same type of revelation. It would have been a revelation that would have changed his whole life, and it did, as, we saw, as we'll see as we go through Acts. It revolutioned everything that he did. It revolutioned every decision that he made. It revolutionized everything that he ever learned it was filtered through a filter of change, a filter of a revelation of Jesus Christ that he is the son of the living God. This is exactly what happened to me that night. And so uh, that morning, excuse me, when I woke up and I said, God, I don't know who you are, but I give my life to you. Now, I want to take you just a few hours later because I got in my car and I wanted to tell somebody. And I was dating a girl at the time who lived on the other side of town and I got in the car and I just wanted to tell somebody that I just gave my life to Jesus. I'm not sure who he is exactly. I, he's, he's probably the God of my mother's religion, but I, I just know that he's real. He's revealed himself to me, and that's all I need to know. He'll teach me the rest. And by the way, he will teach you the rest. Amen. And I remember being in the car, and I remember trying to go down Federal Boulevard in traffic, going southbound, and I get to 8th Avenue in Federal, and the light turns red. And right before I could stop, this brand new black shiny Mustang pulls in front of me and comes to a halt. Well, I have to, I have to press my brakes very hard to avoid hitting him and, uh, from behind. And I was a little upset about that, but you know, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I didn't really know it. But, and so I started right there at that stoplight questioning this revelation. You see, I'm a hard-headed person. The Lord made me lose my hair so you could see the hard head, you know? <laughs> I sat there at that stoplight and I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I apologize for what I'm about to ask you. But can you please show me that this is you talking to me? I don't want to base my whole life change on a dream. I don't want to base my whole life change on these two instances that happened at these churches. I want to know for a fact that it's you speaking to me. Well, the light turned green and the Mustang took off, and the license plate said, last call. I started hitting the steering wheel, getting so excited, because I knew beyond a, uh, a shadow of a doubt that God was speaking to me. Now, 
the Lord speaks to us in different ways. And by the way, primarily he speaks through his word. He speaks through his word. Don't look for these, uh, these ethereal things to happen in your life. Go to his word and he will speak to you. I wasn't reading the word of God. The Lord had to get my attention in a whole different way. But I want to tell you what my response was. My, my action was, is that I repented and I believed. I repented and I believed. We see this language here. We see that Peter says to the, to the men of Israel, repent, be baptized, every single one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I repented and I believed. The second thing that I did is I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. How did I know that? I only knew that because my life changed all of a sudden. The things that I wanted to do before, I didn't want to do anymore. The, the, the pattern that I had in my life before, I didn't want to go by that pattern anymore. The direction that I was heading before, I didn't want to continue in that direction. The Holy Spirit had come into me and changed things. You've heard me say before, just like the Bible says, he will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You will be changed forever. And you know what? Once that change happens, good luck going back. You can't do it. You can't do it. You might, slide, you might backslide, you might fall in your salvation, but guess what? You won't lose your salvation. We're human beings. We all sin. But once God changes your life, it'll be a struggle on the other side. Every time you go to sin, you'll be miserable because the Holy Spirit is living in you. Every time you grieve the Holy Spirit with something that you do, you'll run back to the Lord. How do I know? Because I've done it many times. I've got running shoes to prove it. God is so wonderful. And then this, the third thing that happened in my life is I got baptized. Baptism is not for salvation. Baptism, as some of you are going to experience next week when we have our baptism, it's an outward expression of what God has done in the inside. Now, I waited a couple years to get baptized only because it was never offered to me. I didn't really, I don't know why. Maybe I missed a baptism at our church. I don't know. But we were actually at a, a youth pastor's conference in California and uh, some of my buddies asked me if I want to get baptized. And I said, you know what? I haven't been baptized. I'd love to get baptized. And I got baptized in a hot tub. Praise God. <laughs> Jesus, said, Jesus said in Luke 24, 46 and 47, and I believe it's on the screen here, or it will be. In Luke 24, 46 and 47, Jesus said, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Peter had just instructed the crowd of 3,000 people to repent, to be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. Ananias instructed Paul, remember, be baptized, wash away your sins, call on the name of the Lord. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? As we talk about this this morning and we, we look at these scriptures and we talk about this story of Paul and what the Lord did in his life, I pray that it's something that's happening in your life. And many of you are probably sitting there going, I'm already a believer. This is a little redundant for me. It might be redundant for you, but it might not be redundant for somebody else who's hearing my voice this morning. If there's just one person hearing my voice and it causes them to change this morning, it was worth for you to sit through the redundancy. Amen. But in Joel chapter 2, if you'll go there with me very quickly, in Joel chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Joel 2, 12 and 13, the Bible says these words, Now therefore, this is concerning repentance, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, rend your heart and not your garments, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. This is repentance, folks. And by the way, this verse was given to the house of Israel. And so those of you in the room who maybe you've slid away from the Lord, maybe you haven't had that communication with God, that communion with God, maybe you're in a place where you also need to repent. The Bible says, return to me. Return to me with your heart. But repentance is not just changing your mind. It's not just a matter of changing your mind. It's a matter of changing direction. It's a matter of actually stopping right where you're at and turning around and going in the opposite way in your behaviors, in your actions. In fact, the, the, the re repentance that was given to the house of Israel was, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting. Stop eating. In fact, be so sorrowful over your sin that you stop eating. With weeping, be so sorrowful over your sin 
that you can't even stop from weeping over your sin and with mourning. Rend your heart because they used to tear their garments when, whenever they would, something would offend them, they would tear their garments. The Lord says, tear your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. And then he gives the characteristics of God in here in verse 13. For he is gracious. He is merciful. He's slow to anger of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Isn't that wonderful? Sometimes we grow up with this idea that God is just like a cop waiting to bust you speeding. Sometimes we, we grow up thinking God just wants to judge us. No, himself, he says with his own words here, I am gracious, I am merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and I relent from doing harm. He wants to relent from doing harm. But the question still set, the question still lingers in the air, why are you waiting? You know, you might even be sitting there saying, Pastor, I don't know who you're talking to because I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Now, remember, I told you back when I was a young person, and by the way, if you would have met me when I was in my early 20s and my upper teens, you would have said, you are a sinner. You are a sinner. But guess what? We always compare ourselves with the worst of the worst. We always think of the people who are locked in the maximum security prisons, and we say, well, I'm not like them. We, 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 we compare ourselves with people that we might know, and we say, I'm not like them. Therefore, I'm not a sinner, pastor. What do I need to repent from? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, and I believe it will be on the screen, all have sinned, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I looked up all in the Greek, and it means all. <laughs> all. Everyone. Everyone has sinned. Remember that the high priest, before he would go into the Holy of Holies, had to offer a sacrifice for himself. Because all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. I hate to tell you this, but we're all in the same boat. It's a boat called sinner's boat. We all sin. We're imperfect. So you need to repent. All of us need to repent. I wasn't planning on going here, and I don't have notes for it, but if you go to 2 Kings chapter 5, there's a story about a guy named Naaman. And if I were to start another sermon, which I'm not going to do for those of you who are hungry, getting ready for lunch. There's a story about Naaman, and if I were to start another sermon, it would be called Naaman, the man who waited. The man who waited. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through 15, do you mind reading it with me? 2 Kings chapter 5. If you'll read with me, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. Now listen to these words. But he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back a captive young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Now listen to his response. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. 
Are not, are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. And his servant came near and spoke to him, listen to these words, and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Stop there, I want to tell you the story, and then we'll go to verse 14. Naaman was a commander of the Syrian army. He was a commander. He would have been the top-ranked person, a warrior of Syria. The Bible says, the text says that God gave him a lot of victories, a lot of wars that he won, a lot of battles that he fought and won. He would have been the best of the best. He would have had a chest full of medals. He would have stood so noble. He would have had some of the best clothing, the best robes, the best uniforms. The problem is, is that he still had leprosy underneath those uniforms. He would have had everything. And a lot of times here in the West, especially, we say we have everything. I, I, I'm not a sinner. I have everything. I don't need God. I have everything going for me. But you know what? The Bible says if you have sin in your heart that's unrepented, you're just like that leper. You might be looking good on the outside, but you're dying on the inside. And this man, I can't even imagine him. When he would go to command his military, they had no idea. He had to almost fake it. He had to sit on his horse just right. He had to stand just right. But on the inside, he was dying. Now, he hears that there's a prophet, that there's a prophet in Israel who could heal him. And he goes and he sees this prophet. Now, this man would have been a noble man. In fact, if, if the prophet would have said, hey, you know what? Go conquer these five cities and bring back their scalps. Naaman would have said, you got it. If the prophet would have said, go climb these five mountaintops and bring me back rocks from the top of them. Naaman would have said, you God, because he was a warrior. He was a man's man. He wanted to defeat and conquer. But the prophet tells him something simple. The Lord tells us something simple. Repent, be cleansed. The prophet tells Naaman something simple. Go to the Jordan, which by the way was a very dirty river. Go to the Jordan and dip yourself seven times. Does this guy know who he's talking to? Naaman gets upset. Naaman gets very prideful and says, you know what? I will not do that. Doesn't Syria have some of the best, clearest water? Why can't I go there? It took a servant of his to say, probably very, with his knee shaking possibly, if he would have told you to do something bold, you would have done it, but something so simple and you refuse. Sometimes we need people to shake us up like that. Yeah. And he needed to be shaken. And so Naaman says, all right. I'll go. So verse 14, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And what does the Bible say? His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. That means he looked like me after he dipped seven times. <laughs> Naaman, what are you waiting for? Paul, why are you waiting Men of Israel, why are you waiting? What shall we do? Repent, be baptized, cleanse yourself. And the Bible says in verse 16, listen to Naaman's, listen to his response. As he says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand. Listen to his attitude all of a sudden. As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. Excuse me, 15, my apologies. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, listen to these words, indeed, now I know that there is a God in all the earth. There is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. This morning, we just kind of dug one scripture out of this text that we've been studying for the last couple of weeks. But it was important that we not only hear a testimony, we understand what a testimony is, but that we understand Paul's testimony because as we go forward in Acts, you're going to see Paul and, and the way that he operates. We're going to see the letters as we get into his epistles. We're going to see his words and how he encourages and how he operates. And it all comes down to this fundamental foundation that he had a revelation given to him, and it, it required an action. And that action was that he would repent, that he would cleanse himself, that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see here that Naaman said, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. And my prayer this morning that if you're hearing my voice, and whether you're online or you're, whether you're in the room, if you don't know Jesus this morning, 
may you not wait any longer, and may you gain the knowledge Naaman came to know. May you have that knowledge that there is no other God in all the earth except the God in Israel. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me, and let's pray as the band comes up. Some of you who came here this morning might feel like, wow, that was a heavy sermon. But you know what? It's just truth, folks. Sometimes we have to dip back into the Word of God and we need to have these expressive times together because we don't know who's saved and who's not saved. Folks, the devil's real. Eternity is real. One day the Bible says that we will go one of two places. We will either spend eternity in the lake of fire or will we spend eternity with Jesus Christ? My hope is that everybody in this room and everybody watching, everybody that hears my voice will choose to spend eternity with Jesus. He is the Lord. He is the creator. He is your God. Whether you like it or not, he is your God. The Bible says at the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will happen. My prayer is that it would happen today for those of you who are in that boat where you're not a, a child of the king this morning. As the band plays just a little bit, I want to invite you to pray with me. And if you're not a believer this morning, would you just consider some things as I pray? Father, there are people who don't know you this morning. Maybe nobody in this room, maybe nobody watching right this moment as we're live on the internet. But Lord, maybe somebody who will hear me, hear my voice months from now, years from now. But Lord, I believe that maybe there's somebody even here today. Lord, I pray that as we consider your word this morning, Lord, as we consider the revelation that you give us through scripture, that you are so real, that you are the creator of heaven and earth, that you made the moon and the stars to hang in the sky. You made the sun to shine, Lord. You cause our hearts to beat just in time for all of our lives, Father God, till you call us home. You are the master. You are the creator. You are God. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in here this morning who has gotten that revelation, I just pray, Lord, that they would say these words to you with all of their heart, with all of their meaning. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, I am separated from you because of my sin. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sin that you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, show me who you are. Show me through your word who you are. Lord, put my feet on solid ground this morning. May I be able to declare this morning that you are the God of Israel. Lord Jesus, anybody in this room who has possibly walked away from you or who has, their walk has become a bit of a crawl, I pray, Lord, that they would call out to you this morning in the same way that your prophet Joel said, return to me. Lord, I pray that they would return to you even now, Lord, that they would cry out to you and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me my sins. Cleanse my hands, cleanse my feet, cleanse my mouth, cleanse my eyes, cleanse my heart, Lord. Lord, reestablish my footing on the ground called Christ Jesus. Lord, may I walk with you all the days of my life. Lord Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We give you the praise and the glory that you deserve and you alone deserve. One day we look forward to seeing you face to face. But Lord, may we see you face to face even now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You guys have a wonderful day today.
Lord, we thank you that we can trust you. We can trust you in the times when we don't know why or we don't know how. Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you this week as we go from this place. And I pray your blessing on each one here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.